Okay, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome everybody to this uh, webinar, uh, the title of which is The EU's Economic Recovery and Resilience, the Role of the European Parliament. Uh, so the event has been co-hosted or co-organised by the IIEA and by the European Parliament Liaison Office here in Ireland. So I should say I'm Alan Barrett, I'm the Director of the Economic and Social Research uh, Institute here in Dublin and it's a great uh, honour for me to chair the event and I'd just like to thank the organisers uh, for inviting me uh, to uh, chair the event uh, today. So in a moment I'll, I'll introduce the panel but just for now I just want to give a, a sort of a small bit of background uh, on, on what it is we're, we're, we're going to be talking about today and what it is we're going to try and achieve. So I think probably everybody on the on the call is sort of familiar uh, with the uh, European Union uh, financial patterns, if I can put it like that. Uh, and of course, if you go back to 2020, uh, the, the, uh, the European Union was involved in the discussions around the, the multi-annual financial framework. So that's the financial framework governing uh, the, the, the seven-year period. And of course, when those discussions were happening, uh, everybody was consumed by the COVID crisis and the fear about what COVID was doing to the economies, both in the sort of the short term and the long term. So there was a very strong recognition uh, certainly at the national government level that there needed to be uh, significant economic um, actions to sort of counteract what COVID was doing. Uh, but there was also a sense that maybe there, there needed to be action at the, at the EU level. So coming out of those discussions, uh, we saw then what was called the next generation uh, EU. Uh, that was another you know, part of the sort of the overall funding mechanism. Uh, and then under that again was the re recovery and resilience uh, facility which is a fund equal to about 670 billion euro, a significant amount of money uh, that was to be devoted uh, from a sort of from the, you know, the European Centre uh, with a view to uh, assisting with recovery. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I was just looking back on this, I was kind of aware of it at the time, but I became more interested uh, in the last few days when I knew I was going to be chairing the event today. There's a number of really interesting features around the recovery and resilience uh, facility, uh, or again, more, more broadly back to next generation EU. Uh, and the first issue, which was quite controversial, is the idea that there was a, this, there's a common debt uh, dimension to this. This is the European Union uh, borrowing uh, funds quite controversial, quite quite new and quite different, not something everybody was comfortable with, uh, but it's an interesting feature and it's something we might touch on today. Uh, the, the other, and, and another interesting component uh, of this fund uh, was the focus on green and digital issues in particular. It's probably what you'd expect, uh, but nevertheless, a, a sort of a very proactive statement from the European Union uh, that there should be a focus on green and, and digital issues. And then the third element, which interested me in particular, was the notion of parliamentary, parliamentary scrutiny. Okay, and this is one of the things we will definitely be talking about today. The, the European Parliament has quite a role, it seems to me, in sort of oversight of, of how the monies are being spent and how countries are doing relative to the plans that they have set out. I say it was particularly interesting to me. I, I did sit on the Fiscal Council in the Republic of Ireland, and I'm now on the Fiscal Council in Northern Ireland. And that that sort of role of parliaments in, in overseeing uh, public expenditures. I don't have a clear sense of how active the European Parliament has been in this area previously. So these arrangements here, I'd be really interested to learn from our panelists as to whether or not uh, this is something that, it, that is new and is different than if, if it's going to be developed. So lots to discuss. Uh, and I'm delighted to say we've got a, a wonderful set of, of panelists. Now, unfortunately, I'm just checking my WhatsApp here. Uh, one of our panelists uh, may have been delayed, uh, but uh, hopefully he'll be joining us anyway before too long. But let's talk about the folks we do have uh, with us. So firstly, it's a, a pleasure to introduce Kieran Cook. And Kieran's an MEP uh, for Dublin, represented the Green Party who was first elected in 2019. Uh, he's a member of the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, also the Committee on Transport and Tourism, and he's also a member of the, the delegations for relations with the United States and Albania. Uh, and I think well known to uh, an Irish audience previously, a uh, city councillor, TD for Dunleary, and a minister of state for horticulture, sustainable travel, planning and heritage. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to welcome Francis Fitzgerald, also an MEP, of course, also I think uh, first elected to the European Parliament in 2019 uh, for Fine Gael, and is currently a vice president uh, at the European People's Party Group. And I think congratulations might be in order, Francis, you were recently re-elected uh, to that post. So Francis currently serves on the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee 
uh, the Women's Rights and Equality Committee and the Development Committee. And of course, back uh, in Ireland, she was a former GD and Senator, served as Taunashta for a period of time, and was also Minister for Business, Enterprise, Innovation, uh, Minister for Justice and Equality, and uh, was Minister for Children and Youth Affairs as well. So um, has Dra uh, Dragas hasn't actually joined us yet, so I might hold off on uh, his introduction uh, when he actually arrives. Uh, but for now, uh, well, actually, one more housekeeping issue or two more before I hand over to, to Kieran. The first is uh, people should submit questions through the Q&A function. Uh, so if you have a question for the panelists, please just put it in the Q&A function, include your name and your affiliation, and we'll try to get as many questions as possible. And then the other thing is if you want to become active on Twitter uh, in the discussion, please feel free to do so. But it would be great if you could add at IIEA or at PP in Ireland, that's the European Parliament in Ireland, at PP in Ireland, uh, and then we might be able to circulate uh, any tweets a little bit further. So with that, I am going to hand over to, uh, ah, Dragas, you've joined us. Uh, I can just see that that's great. That makes life uh, neater uh, that we have all our panelists uh, at, the, at the one time. I was just uh, giving you a little bit of background, Dragas, and uh, I was interview uh, introducing our panelists. So uh, I, I'm just going to do that now for your good self before we get into the discussion. So uh, Dragas Pizlaru, uh, an MEP from Romania, and again, first elected to the parliament in 2019. So I guess we're, we're talking to three freshman parliamentarians, um, I, I think. So his party, I'm just going to use the initials USO Plus, uh, is part of the liberal, uh, a centrist liberal Renew Europe group. So he is a member of the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs, Committee on Employment and Social Affairs, Subcommittee on Tax Matters and the Delegation for Relations with Japan. And he was the Parliamentary Rapporteur for the COVID-19 Pandemic Recovery Fund. Uh, and hence he has particular insights on the topic that we're going to be discussing today. So great that you're here, uh, Marcus. We look forward to hearing you for, uh, in a couple of minutes. So what we are going to do is we're going to take each of the presentations in order. But as I look at my screen, has Kieran dropped out? Okay, well, look, Francis, it's just as well. You're such a professional that at a, at a second's notice, I know you can uh, come in here. So okay, we'll kick off. Take okay, five that's, minutes. That's, that's no problem. I'll do my best. Thanks very much. Uh, Alan, and also to the organizers, IEA and EPL, EPLO, it's very nice to be asked uh, to speak about uh, the uh, economic recovery and, and, and resilience uh, pact from the point of view of, of, the, of the parliament. And I'm glad to have that uh, opportunity because the parliament has been very uh, involved. And as you say, this is something that's, uh, uh, you remarked yourself, Alan, this is something that's relatively, uh, you know, innovative really in terms of the, the kind of balances around this fund and how it's been monitored as we go on. So I think it's a very good time to take stock. Um, it's still in early enough days in relation to the implementation, of course, um, but it's a good opportunity to take stock of what we agreed on next generation EU and the recovery and resilience facility. And I think it's very good to talk about it. It's something we should be very proud of. I mean, in the sense of the EU's reaction to, to crisis. I mean, over the, the decades, the EU has shown that it can respond to crisis. And of course, from a vaccine point of view, last year was a slow start. But, you know, in the end, a very effective way of getting vaccine uh, to people, but also in terms of the recovery and re resilience uh, facility, um, because 2020 will be remembered as a devastating year. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But I think the EU's economic response and in particular the recovery and resilience facility is a symbol of what the EU can do when urgent measures are needed. And I, I think it's, you know, it's important for us to say that. Um, we, we all remember the historic Marathon EU summit in July last year, uh, when I think EU leaders did show, uh, with a lot of negotiating and, and challenges, true collective responsibility in the, in the end to agree on the broad outline of the RRF and the next generation EU, and we've come a long way since then. I think it's also worth, from a, as a politician, remarking on the dynamic at the time in relation to Germany having the presidency, um, Merkel wanting you know, this to go through, and of course then the president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, um, you know, working closely with Merkel and, and obviously with all the member states. Uh, I would say that the European Parliament has played a key role in further improving the RRF, particularly by driving forward the six pillars uh, which RRF should be based around. And you've mentioned some of them, Alan Green, digital, the economic cohesion and competitiveness, 
social uh, and territorial cohesion, health, economic, social, and institutional resilience and policies for the next generation. The Parliament also insisted on the key targets of 37% spending on climate and 20% spending on digital. Really looking ahead, these are the issues that all our economies across Europe have to cope with uh, into the next generation. And uh, these were heavily discussed in committees, in my own econ committee, but in the Parliament through a lot of the resolutions uh, on COVID uh, that took place in the Parliament. Uh, so Parliament ensured that if the investments were to be spent correctly on the sectors that really matter as we recover from COVID-19. And crucially, Parliament uh, ensured that there would be adequate scrutiny and transparency of spending, uh, vital aspects uh, to the RF that may not make the headlines, but are really important. And of course, that's an ongoing question. How good is the scrutiny? How good is the transparency? And how is that actually happening? And where have we got to at this point? And as I say, in some ways, it's early enough. And I've no doubt lessons will be learned from the first sort of number of presentations from various member states. Um, it's one of the largest EU funding programmes, um, so we really have to use it to repair the devastation, so you need proper parliamentary scrutiny as well. Um, it is about looking to the future, it's about wanting to build back better, and based on the key pillars I've outlined uh, uh, already. Now, I will mention another aspect that we in the Parliament spoke about quite a lot, and I had a particular interest in it myself, and a lot of my own amendments covered it, and that's the gender dimension of the COVID crisis, because it has had a differential impa impact, and it's terribly important when we come to spend the money that we're aware of the differential impact in terms of the care economy, in terms of uh, women's uh, jobs and employment, of course, the gender pay gap, and the pension gap, both of which existed before COVID and, and may well have been made somewhat worse by it. So uh, member states now have to take this opportunity to enshrine gender equality targets in their national recovery plans. So, I mean, that's terribly important. And it, it means you look at this from an economic point of view, the care infrastructure, digital literacy, um, and of course, the other areas, sustainable finance for SMEs and so on, investing in our cities. So I, I, I think there's quite a job for our member states to do to make sure, and for Ireland, uh, that we are meeting the criteria that have been uh, laid down, that the money is not being spent on anything else. And I think there'll be very you know, serious uh, scrutiny about that. So it's all about building back better to the green digital and more inclusive economy. And I think that's a social imperative as well as an economic one. It's not for ordinary budgetary uh, expenditures. Um, Ireland is going to get one billion. We probably don't need to go. I think the, the audience here will be very clear uh, about the, the kind of money that's been given. Uh, 1 billion in grants under the RRF for the period 20 to 21 to 22, and a further set of grants in, in 2023. It's not a huge chunk, but I think there's a very important point to be made here, that with this investment across Europe, it's not just about what Ireland gets, uh, uh, it's about what all of the member states are getting, because the more the European economy can be helped to recover, the more that's going to help Ireland because we're such an open economy. So as the money is invested in other countries and their economies improve as well, clearly that helps us enormously. Uh, you might take a look at the numbers and see, for example, that Italy is getting 68 billion, Ireland's getting 1 billion, Germany's getting 41 uh, billion. Very clear set of criteria in how it was allocated, but I suppose it's a reflection on how well Ireland was doing in terms of the, of the economy. And again, the only country with growth uh, last year. So, um, let me just say then that um, the basic point really uh, from an Irish point of view is to ensure the policies will encourage employment and economic growth and reduce inequality, promote sustainability, inclusivity and good living uh, standards. That's what we have to do. So going back to parliamentary scrutiny, which is the theme, uh, just a few points before I finish. The RRF sets out a new paradigm for parliamentary scrutiny. The Parliament has insisted on being involved at all stages of the process, and that's still the case, as I've said, for the implementation of the facility. Notably, the Parliament can launch recovery and resilience dialogues with the Commission. We've had three so far. And in theory, Parliament must receive information concerning Member States' recovery and resilience plans from the Commission. Now, I think that we as parliamentarians would like that communication to be even better from the Commission than it is uh, at present. 
But again, I would say it's a work in progress because it's still in, in early days. But I think if we want to have the trust of European citizens and that we want to ensure there's confidence in how this money is spent, we need clear transparency and parliamentary scrutiny. And I think there's a real opportunity here for us to show this uh, as politicians in a very open way uh, within the structures in the parliament. I'm going to finish by saying something about the rule of law and the RRF. There is an increasing debate uh, in uh, the European Parliament in relation to the uh, rule of law. Um, for example, Poland and Hungary's re recovery and resilience plans have still not been approved by the Commission. And I think the Commission is taking a stand here in relation to you know, legally binding milestones when it comes to the disbursement of the funds. And it goes back to the fundamental values that we have in the EU and making sure that all member states are obliged to implement all EU rules and to respect basic values and fundamental rights. And when member states go against this, like independence of the judiciary or free media, the EU is increasingly taking a stand and using a conditionality around finance. And again, that is something I think everybody will be watching over the next couple of months to see how that works out, because you have the recent ruling by the Polish judiciary, for example, which says that the Polish constitution trumps EU law. That's a worrying development. And we saw that enormous march in, in Poland just recently. So again, huge money is, is going to Poland. And, you know, you, you use uh, the conditionality, how that's going to be used, how it's going to be, uh, how it's going to be dealt with, you know, Poland is getting 21 billion, for example, I think that is something uh, to watch very carefully. So look, there's some, you know, initial thoughts on parliamentary scrutiny and how it has gone. Um, but I, I think that I conclude by saying that, you know, in a sense, the plan has a small direct impact from a macroeconomic point of view in Ireland. But I'd go back to making the point that when you look at it across Europe, then it will certainly help um, Ireland's economic growth as well, despite the one billion compared to what many other countries are getting. Great, thanks uh, so much, Francis. Actually, that was fascinating, and you touched on a whole range of issues. Um, I had half hope might come up. I uh, wasn't sure if they would, uh, but great that you put some of the, uh, the, the the legal issues there on the agenda. So, uh, Dragos, I, I'm guessing you're an old pro like Francis is and, and can step into the breach because unfortunately Kieran is having trouble with his iPad, uh, or so I'm being told. So while he's rebooting his iPad, um, would it be okay if you uh, gave your five or ten minute contribution at, at this point? And once again, it's it's a pleasure to welcome you to the to the event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, it's 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 indeed uh, it's a great uh, privilege for me to to uh, to be there, invited by the Institute of International European Affairs. Um, I, I used to be in a previous life a researcher in social science, uh, and as an economist by background, I was actually looking uh, at the Institute for uh, a lot of the policy papers and, and, and other good things that you've been doing in the past. So congratulations for that and many thanks for the invitation. I, I'm actually very glad that um, uh, I, I, IPLO uh, Ireland uh, supported you in this endeavor. And it's reminding me uh, one year ago when uh, I was actually using the, you know, the, the the power of um, the EBLO's offices from 13 member states um, in, uh, in my call to consult citizens in order to shape the uh, most historical instrument that the EU have, uh, has ever created, the Recovery and Resilience Facility. So th let me you know, just use a little bit of uh, you know, um, the, my, my own perspective as a co-rapporteur to explain to you uh, a little bit more the insights that Francis has already been highlighting. So um, how did it all start? Uh, back in May last year, the Commission announced the recovery plan, the Next Generation EU, and with the big news that 90% of the Next Gen EU funds would be dedicated to finance the Recovery and Resilience Facility, this enormous instrument dedicated to reforms and investments. And um, when we read it in, in the European Parliament, uh, as a team of three co-rapporteurs from each um, of the political groups, so EPP, uh, SND, and, and, and Renew that I'm representing, uh, we were almost uh, you know, uh, clearly <clears throat> uh, actually uh, uh, on the same page. So first of all, the RRF was missing a structure. <laughs> the discussion that had, has been uh, you know, uh, developed in the council with the white smoke at the end, agreed on the 672.5 billion euros, 
Uh, but basically, the concern that we had at the beginning was related to the fact that uh, this may be interpreted as an ATM, as a cash machine uh, left at the member state discretion and, and, and the questions about the EU value added behind. The second thing was the RRF was missing democratic uh, legitimacy and accountability. The role of citizens representative was nowhere uh, in terms of... Uh, you know, you had emergency breaks um, for the governments, but um, there was nothing about, you know, the role of the European Parliament, the national parliaments, the uh, civil society organizations, the NGOs, I mean, the local authorities, I mean, nothing about that. Um, and, this, you know, the last point that was actually quite striking was that in a thing which was called the next generation EU, um, I was actually doing a control F, you know, trying to find the word children child or youth or young, um, and there was nothing. <laughs> so you can actually check that historically, you're gonna go back. And, and, and that was actually quite striking because I mean, uh, it was a little bit of uh, irony uh, that the, 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 the youth of today would actually pay the bill in the future, uh, but there was nothing, no reference towards um, you know, the youth, uh, although the name was Next Generation EU. So what happened it was that in August, when, when already you know, some people, um, uh, I mean, there, there were quite, quite a few people in holidays at that time. And, you know, end of August and September, I had a consultation process um, with 13 member states uh, through the EPLOS and through the communication uh, department of the uh, director of the, of the parliament. And um, we were able thus to consult with youth organizations, with the government officials, with uh, you, you know, um, uh, social partners, uh, with uh, academ uh, academia. So, and that's how basically the, the whole thing about having a balanced approach uh, came, uh, came to reality. Uh, that is how uh, I came up with the structure of six pillars, and then um, uh, basically we 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 uh, had the member states uh, um, the, the the need for the member states to to address all of them. Uh, we had the specific pillar dedicated to children and youth. Um, we actually put forward the idea that member states need to explain in the plan how they consult the citizens and their representatives. Uh, and then, of course, um, we uh, we've been discussing how to uh, increase the role of the parliament with setting up the group, the working group to analyze the plans and monitoring the implementation uh, with the exchange of views uh, with uh, you know, two delegated acts that were not so easy to approve uh, when I'm talking about social expenditure and the scoreboard that will actually monitor the implementation. And last but not least, there's a, there's a hidden thing and <laughs> not so many people realize that we actually introduced, and that was uh, one of my ideas there as a contribution um, we introduced a, a review after two years. So basically there is, there is a way to amend plans after two years, which is very important because right now, I mean, you know that the, the approval of the, of the <clears throat> recovery and resilience plans was a process that was, uh, you know, quite, uh, uh, quite, fast, quite, quite fast paced. Everyone was in a hurry. Um, but in two years time, we from the parliament uh, side, we can actually uh, look uh, at, at the implementation stage and, and, and say, okay, I mean, this is disappointing. This is going to, uh, not in the right direction. Um, and, and, and then of course the commission would actually be in a situation to discuss with the member states uh, even uh, the revision of the plans if the case. So that's actually quite interesting. And it was also part of the negotiation. So, um, I mean, just to, to, um, uh, to add that uh, from my perspective as a co-operator on the RF, uh, when I look back of what we've accomplished in one year, I feel quite proud, honestly. Um, this is not about you know self-sufficiency or whatever, but it's I'm actually proud not of myself, but of how the parliament stood up to its ambition, how we had a very, very strong position. If you refer to the vote, for instance, that we had in Econ Budge, we had a, we had a very, very large majority, completely uh, not customary for, for um, you know this kind of important files. Uh, and that's how we got this with, with this strong position and with four groups uh, united, we, we, we got into the trilogues and we obtained what, to, what we obtained in the, in the, in the regulation. And I'm, I'm really also very proud that the member states managed to draft their plans accordingly, um, you know, according to the 11 criteria, taking into account all the things that, that were required from them, transparency, consultations, and so on. I know that the, 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 the process was not ideal and, and we could have done more, um, but it was indeed a, a time pressure. And, and again, we I'm actually proud as well because we wanted to show 
that uh, a, a new EU economic governance model is possible, one that is better when it involves more European Parliament. And, and, and indeed, we have been giving an example of solidarity um, in which you know, the European Parliament um, as a direct representative of, of the citizens played a major role. And right now I am a, a member of the working group that is responsible with, with the implementation of the RF. Right now we have the two delegated acts that have been drafted by the commission um, we have, uh, you, you know, uh, quite quite a number of the uh, of the plans that have been already approved, um, and we are right now, you know, kicking in with with that. The pre-financing has actually arrived in many of the member states, um, and 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 again, I'm looking as well at the at, at the Irish plan um, and with with the one billion uh, reforms for and investments in there. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm really, really glad uh, about the green light that has been uh, provided in mid-July. So uh, everything is set for implementation. I'm looking forward to, to hearing your first impressions on uh, the Irish plan and on the uh, entire framework. So that's from my side. Of course, I have a lot of other stories um, about the negotiation with the German presidency and within the parliament, uh, but that, that would probably be um, the next occasion when, when I, I might actually uh, visit physically Dublin and I can actually tell you all these stories. So thank you again for the opportunity. And, and, uh, and, and again, I'm really glad that I, I could be a part of uh, this uh, uh, wonderful webinar. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much uh, for that, Dragos. Again, very interesting points. We, we, we might tease some of those additional stories out of you during the questions and answer session. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how we get on. So, Kieran, it looks like your internet is stable. Uh, you've been with us now for a while, not drifting in and out. So, listen, fingers crossed. Uh, you'll, you'll stay with us now, and maybe we'll look forward to your, uh, your contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the irony is not lost on me as we discuss green and digital uh, transitions to uh, have uh, technology uh, fail me uh, at, the, at the beginning of, of the webinar. But look, um, let's talk a little bit about the, the bigger picture. Uh, for me, as a, as a first term um, uh, member of the European Parliament, it has been immersion by fire, really because the pandemic kicked in not long after six months of being in the parliament. And we had a fantastic dawn, I think, of uh, this uh, mandate of this session with the announcement of a European Union Green Deal. Uh, I, I think there was a lot of enthusiasm from certainly the Green Group and from others within the parliament that we would take this language that has been floating around for almost a decade and translated into actual policy instruments that would deliver. And the kind of discussions that we had over the multi-annual financial framework that would um, dictate uh, the, the spending of the EU over a seven year period were certainly strongly aligned with this European Green Deal. And then of course the pandemic struck and uh, in many respects, we went into hibernation and certainly uh, distant, distant working uh, for a long period of time. And yet within all of that, the work continued on plotting a way out of the deep recession that the European Union and indeed uh, globally had, had, had hit. And I think the recovery and resilience facility is a very tangible expression of the ability of 27 member states to work together in the midst of a crisis and plot a way out the other side. From an Irish perspective, we don't perhaps hear as much uh, about the recovery and resilience facility as we would in other European Union uh, countries. But as Dragas and Francis have alluded to, uh, as a share of our national finances, it is a lot smaller here in Ireland than it is in other member states. So the 989 million in grants is um, really um, very small in comparison to the uh, amount of spending we've had to deal with the COVID pandemic in terms of supports uh, and other, other finances that Ireland has to deal with. Nonetheless, um, it is interesting to observe the degree of uh, strengthening of green commitments that we've seen in the Recovery and Resilience Facility. And when Ursula von der Leyen launched Ireland's recovery plan in Grange Gorman um, a couple of months ago, uh, she paid testimony to uh, the strong green thrust of 
the how the recovery funding would be spent in Ireland. And a lot of that money will go into the renovation wave, into upgrading our building stock, which is a very tangible expression uh, or manifestation of the just transition of bringing people's energy bills down, uh, also lowering their greenhouse gas emissions, and in doing so, uh, uh, reaching out and giving a very progressive message uh, that the, the green uh, emergence from the pandemic is not just for the elites, it's for, it's for all. And I think that was a very, a very positive message. As I look across uh, the European Union now, and as we look at the Fit for 55 package, which will inform a lot of how we spend the recovery and resilience uh, money, I can see, you know, quite a challenge playing out of those who come from a political family that are strongly supportive of the importance of climate action and perhaps members of other groups who are not quite as keen on ensuring that we embed climate action at the heart of the recovery. Fundamentally, the question is whether we come out of the COVID pandemic differently from how we went into it. And I think that question in many member states is still an open-ended one. And the debate about uh, uh, rule of law, about democracy in Poland and in other member states that we're seeing at the moment, there's a huge argument in play about the role of Brussels, about the direction that Brussels would like to go in and how member states will subscribe to that or not as, as time goes by. I think as well, there is the challenge of operating by consensus across all digital families, or, or across all political families. And I think particularly as we look at, you know, a green transition, uh, there are some who are much keener on this than others. And certainly I see an element of greenwash uh, at play uh, in terms of those who espouse doing things differently, but throwing in uh, huge funding for liquid nat uh, natural gas for a fossil fuel that will simply not deliver the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions that we need in the time frame that we are hoping for. I mean, in a nutshell, we hope to wean ourselves off greenhouse gas emissions over the next 30 years. And if we're to do that, we have to start now and we have to be very ambitious in every action that we take. And certainly from the committees that I sit on, the Transport Committee and the Energy Committee, the ITRI uh, Committee that deals with research, telecoms uh, and energy, I'm seeing a robust debate about the extent to which we embrace the green transition. And I think any, any kind of obfuscating or watering down of the package will seriously compromise our ability to live up to what science demands. And the kind of discussions that I have with, um, with Dragos's colleagues and with Francis's colleagues are very often about a real watering down of the radical transition that is needed if we are to align the European recovery in line with what science demands on climate action. So there is a real challenge there, and I don't want to, I don't want to kind of gloss over that or, or say that um, we are all singing from the same hymn sheet. And even if we are all committed to this green transition, we have a huge amount of challenges both in Ireland and in other member states to deliver uh, what, what we wish to achieve. And the kind of rows that we have in the Irish context and the kind of overruns well, the rows about, let's say, putting a metro into Dublin or the cost overruns we've seen with the National Children's Hospital would make one worry as to whether we can embrace the massive challenge to turn the super tanker around towards a low carbon decarbonized path. So there is huge challenges uh, ahead. There's huge challenges in the choices that we make on the energy that we use, the kind of permitting and regulation 
uh, procedures that we have. And I think there is a role for the European Union to simplify uh, the processes and the hoops that we go through in order to deliver this green transition. I leave it at that for the moment, and I look forward to the discussion with the rest of the panel and the audience. Thanks so much, Karen. And just if we, if we could get you to clarify, I mean, were you as much as in your remarks there that in spite of the uh, green dimension uh, to the Resilience Recovery Fund, uh, that you think it still lacks a little bit ambition and that you sort of feel that uh, maybe Dragos political grouping and France's political grouping are, are, are not as ambitious uh, as, as your political grouping would say. I mean, am I correct in picking you up there? Oh, oh, oh absolutely. Uh, uh, and I, I mean, don't ask me, but ask um, civil society organisations who are tracking this. Um, and look, this is, this is at the heart of the challenge that we have, that science is demanding that we make deep and rapid cuts in our greenhouse gas emissions, which means a huge move towards renewable energy, towards uh, energy storage, towards electrification, towards um, uh, grid reinforcement. Um, and I, I don't see the same level of ambition from the other political families. Maybe this is just because I'm looking at it through the lens of the Transport Committee uh, and the Energy Committee, which can be quite perhaps reluctant and quite conservative in outlook. But I think um, there is a real uphill struggle to move Central Europe away from coal. And rather than kind of jumping from coal onto gas, to move beyond that again onto renewables and to um, speed up their rollout at a very rapid pace. So I, I do find within many member states a reluctance to embrace the deep changes that are required. And that is reflected through the political groupings that are, that are um, in the parliament from those member states. Okay, thanks for that. I'm going to put a question to you, Francis, then from, from the audience. And in the context of answering the question, if, if you want to address some of the comments, Kieran, uh, that would work. The, the question is from Gerard Gibbons from the Council, uh, the Congress of Trade Unions, and, it, and it's about um, stakeholder engagement. Uh, so let me just read the question, if I might, uh, and, and then I'll, I'll let you take a run. And by the way, Dragos, I have a question here for you, to which uh, I'll get you to answer, and, and you can address uh, some of Kieran's uh, points in that. So from Gerard Gibbons, so what is the panelist's assessment of the stakeholder consultations that took place before Ireland's NRRP was finalised? He said, the Commission's July implementing decision for Ireland's plan states that, and it seems to be a quote here, it's crucial to involve all local authorities and stakeholders concerned, including social partners, throughout the implementation of the investments and reforms included in the plan. Is this a de facto criticism of the non-involvement of civil society to date? So Gerard seems to be suggesting here that there, there, there wasn't as much stakeholder consultation uh, in developing Ireland's uh, resilience and recovery plan. Uh, so Francis, can I, can I put that one to you for, for a reaction? And if yes. you want to pick up on some of Kieran's uh, points, feel free to do so. You know, uh, stakeholder engagement on a plan like this, I mean, I. I don't think we're coming from a particularly uh, developed engagement with stakeholders, let me put it like that. Um, and I think that my own sense of it, looking, on, looking from Brussels, if you like, um, was that there could have been greater stakeholder involvement. Um, and I think the mechanisms to do that probably could have been uh, more robust. I think there were, um, and there may be people who are joining us today who could say more about this. Um, you know, there was, um, I think there was certainly a social partnership engagement, no question of that. But in terms of reaching out to the broader community, I mean, there were a lot of submissions made and a lot of points were made. Um, but I think, you know, that could be ongoing as well and could be developed more. Because if you want to do the kind of things that we said should be done from a European Parliament point of view, I mean, this is ongoing. This is ongoing spending. We just signed the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the final, the financing agreement only gets signed, you know, uh, shortly. Uh, that's not done yet. So again, it's, it's, it's quite early. So, I mean, I, I think that 
you know, uh, uh, for example, myself, I've run various, you know, conferences and engagements with NGOs here on different aspects of the plan, uh, for example, care, and, you know, made sure that that got included. But again, you've got to monitor how the spending is going to go and the whole question on equality, you know, how is it actually going to reach out to women and men? That, that needs to be monitored, monitored on an ongoing basis. And I think there's huge scope for ongoing uh, stakeholder engagement. On the points that uh, Kieran uh, is making, I mean, he would say that, wouldn't he? I mean, look at, I mean, I totally recognize Kieran's commitment and the green commitment. Uh, but I think it's widely shared, but there are real concerns. So, for example, myself and a, a number of uh, parliamentarians have done work on a just transition. I mean, this is a huge concern, whether it's in the Midlands in Ireland or in Eastern Europe. I mean, you do have to look at the just transition funding and that has to reach out to those communities. Um, you also have to have a just transition for citizens. Um, uh, uh, for families, for business, for industry. And uh, I think those are the kind of issues that my party have been looking at particularly and saying, you know, what is the actual, what is the implementation? We know the goals, but what does the implementation look like? What is the pace of it? And, and how do we manage that? I mean, you take a very practical issue right now. You look at the potential for fuel poverty. I mean, we were discussing that in the parliament this week. I mean, fuel poverty right across uh, Europe and the, the cost of gas. I mean, there's an immediate sort of uh, challenge uh, for, for, our, for our families, for our citizens, uh, for our businesses uh, to be able to cope with this. So, you know, I, I, and if you look at the taxonomy, I mean, we have set up the criteria by which, you know, we will put sustainable finance and finance will be given to various projects. But again, um, you know, you have to, um, to monitor how that is going, see how it's, it's being effective. And I think it's not so much resistance. Everyone knows we have to do it, but it's the practical implications and making sure that we're, you know, sustaining and helping people along the way as we make the transition we have to make. And there are hard choices. I mean, Karen is right about this. We see the choices in Ireland that have been got a lot of discussion recently. And it's an enormous it's an enormous transition for people in all our daily lives. And we're going to, you know, government has to help people uh, to make that. So I think it's, it's a little early to, you know, to claim that uh, there's resistance coming uh, from other political parties. I think it's around the implementation and, and how it's going to be handled and the supports that will be needed at that point. Now, I think some member states are certainly very, um, uh, you know, some member states are, are very ambivalent uh, uh, about the Green Deal, no question of that, and find it very hard to convince their populations and their members of parliament. And we see that in the parliament. Okay, thanks, Francis. Dragos, I'm going to come to you and uh, uh, feel free to respond again to, again, the green issues, because uh, there's a good lively discussion clearly happening here. Feel free to address this issue of stakeholder engagement because you mentioned it in your opening remarks. Uh, but just in addition, can I, I put another uh, question uh, to you? And as a fellow economist, I'm, I'm kind of happy to drop this one on you and you, you'll see when, when I read it out. So this is from Daryl Lawler, uh, who's one of the IIEA economics uh, researchers. And the question is, are the panel concerned about rising, rising levels of inflation in the euro area? Okay, and just to develop the theme then, how should the disbursement of funds from next generation EU be managed so that they do not contribute to any overheating of the European economy? So this is a, a very strong issue in Ireland uh, that with the sort of stronger than expected recovery uh, from the COVID crisis, we, we've now moved on to the sort of fears of, of overheating through our, our own investment strategy. So it would be interesting to hear then, is, you know, what's the view at the European level uh, of, of the overheating possibilities uh, from substantial uh, government in, investment. So there's about three things floating around there, Dargis, so feel, feel free to uh, tackle uh, any, or, any or all. Yeah, so let me start first with the question and then I will comment uh, uh, the other two. Um, indeed, the, the, the risk of overheating. Now, um, we, we can see it from uh, a monetary perspective, or we can see it from, you know, the, uh, in, from an industrial investment perspective. The, the reality is that, um, I mean, the, the, the good news is that the money will not just be, you know, poured into, uh, you know, consumption and uh, into uh, basically 
um, expenditure that is be recurrent. And that's one of the rules in the regulation that says that this money is not going to be used for recurrent expenditure or substituting recurrent expenditure from the government side. So from, from the design of it, it's, it's meant to go um, into investments that are forward looking. It's not about the, the entire purpose for the recovery was not to go back where we were before the pandemics, it was to more or less you know, change the paradigm in how we see our society, our economy, how we, we are actually managing our resources and with what type of technology. Um, and that's about the dual transformation, you know, the, the, uh, the green and the digital uh, transformation. So we, if we are actually putting the money into developing or strengthening you know, value chains into uh, more or less uh, having uh, uh, an approach that would um, uh, upgrade our economy and, and, and our society, then, then uh, there is uh, certainly not uh, the, the danger of overheating as um, it would have been uh, by just using the money and pouring it uh, in, uh, you know, spreading it and spraying it throughout the economy. Now, in terms of the um, the actual rules of disbursement, I mean, we have the pre-financing that is 13%, uh, and, and indeed, uh, this, this, this is the case for all the member states. And then you have these milestones and targets that would actually trigger twice a year um, the, uh, the disbursements from, uh, from the European Commission. I mean, the, the, the good part is that we are not going to have, you know, twice a year shocks uh, in, 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 in the markets because, you know, the member state is supposed to be spending and, and, and investing and, and doing, doing the right things all throughout the period. So it will be on aggregate period. Now, another important thing would be related to the fact that uh, a component that is vital and it's actually critical for any type of disbursements would actually be the reforms. And many of the reforms that we are talking about are related to things that member states have actually missed um, or, or not necessarily fulfilled from the country specific recommendations of the past. And here we are talking about um, a, a lot of things that are you know, more or less related to the sustainability of public finance to uh, you know, in, uh, supporting the SMEs uh, and the SME sector um, to um, you know, related to cohesion and how uh, you know, the pension reform is seeing, you know, how, how the demographic challenges are actually going to be perceived. And, and here, uh, Again, with all these kind of reforms, um, I mean, uh, the perspective of get, getting the economy overheating is actually uh, uh, lower because we are talking about structural reforms um, and, and not just, you know, trying to to, to push for um, the things as they are right now. So these are this is this this is part of my answer uh, towards the question related to uh, to um, uh, the monetary uh, disequilibrium um, that that may be caused by the RF. Of course, um, there will be an inflationary pressure, just to, to clarify from a purely economic perspective, there will be an inflationary pressure. But if you put that money into things that will have a return on society, and then again, we have a very dense period until 2026, then I think that this can actually be managed in a sustainable uh, way. Now, related to, uh, you know, very brief comments related to what uh, was uh, discussed on, on, on stakeholder consultation. I do believe that the Commission is trying right now to compensate, um, you know, in terms of uh, the, the 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 length and 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 the scope of the consultations that were taking place before. Um, I mean, before the uh, approval of the plans, um, we, we were actually asking in from the Parliament position um, to have as an evaluation criteria the degree and the length of consultations, and then the member states, the Council, refused that, saying that. Uh, we, we don't have time enough because speed is of the essence and so on. So right now, the commission uh, more or less uh, has, uh, you know, needed actually basically just to check if there is a chapter in the plan related consultations in for some member states that was we consulted people, full stop, <laughs> and that's it. And for us, from some other member states, there was a lengthy, you know, description of, uh, you know, all the stakeholders that have been consulted and so on. So it's it's right normal right now for the commission to, to go back and say, okay, but for the monitoring, can we have some sort of a consultation body or, or arrangements where to understand that um, we are not going to have to be in a situation in which uh, this, this money is going to be used 
uh, and, and then later on, people will feel uh, completely, uh, you know, disaligned with with the purpose and and what how and how the money has been actually spent. So I would say that it's it's I'm, I'm encouraging that, and I think it's a it's a good thing from the commission to ask to 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 do this kind of consultation at least in the morning. Last but not least, <clears throat> on the ambition. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, Kieran has actually started here <laughs> a political debate. I mean. Uh, Certainly, I mean, as renewed with Pascal Canfin, the president of the Envy Committee, we cannot be accused of not actually being ambitious. Uh, that's that's for sure. Uh, so I would say that from time to time, renew is even more ambitious than the Greens on 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 issues related to you know fast forward uh, towards um, a, you know the green transformation. Uh, but indeed, I, I think that what Francis mentioned the, the the social implications on one hand, and I will add also. The fact that the energy mix um, is it's actually a problematic thing as well in terms of transition. I mean, we are witnessing right now uh, with the price increase, and then we had a meeting today in the parliament, the ITRE committee with Kadri Simpson. We are witnessing right now a response of the markets towards you know what we are doing, and 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 again, uh, technology is there, but 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 is not delivering all the answers already in terms of uh, you, you know how to uh, make full use of renewables by. Uh, by by uh, you know having the technologies that will be, be able to store uh, you have to have the storage uh, and and so on and so forth so i would say that uh, ambition i think that we all have ambition uh, in the european parliament at least the groups that are here for sure uh, but but it's also you need to have the what, what it takes to implement it so it's like about practicality uh, as, as well so I, I might be dreaming about things but you are going to accomplish the things that are feasible to be done and and, and i think that uh, instead of you know seeing the differences among us, we should actually work together as we've done very very well with the RRF, with the Fit for 55, um, to to make it happen. Uh, and, and so I'm 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 suggesting a more constructive approach here, <laughs> uniting us rather than to see the differences, which I I feel that maybe actually uh, you know forced a little bit uh, from time to time. So that would be my political. Political answer, if you, if you may. Thank you, Alan. Just a yeah, very a very quick point. Christine Lagarde was in our econ committee recently, and she said that it was, of course, the high energy prices that are currently driving inflation, the temporary VAT changes, and the difficulties in global supply which she said she expected them to dissipate next year. Now, of course, that remains to be seen. Where are energy prices going to go? Because if you exclude uh, energy prices from the calculation, inflation is at 1.7, which is still below the ECB's target of 2%. So I think it does need very careful watching, uh, but maybe not panicking uh, you know, just yet. And I, I, I thought her comments were quite interesting on it. No, the, the, without a doubt, they're interesting, but I guess the, the, the history of inflation, uh, which has been written a number of occasions, the fear is always that once it's it's about people's expectations of inflation rather than the actuality. And I guess if this lasts for long enough and inflation expectations build up, uh, then you, you, you hit a point uh, that, that gets troubling. We've only a few minutes left, and uh, I thought this was going to be a, a, a somewhat technical uh, discussion about the role of the European Parliament, but it seems politics is, uh, is, is breaking out. And I, I'm going to put a, a blunt question to you, Francis, uh, if I may, from Dara Mor Moriarty of the IEA. Uh, and when you were mentioning uh, issues around the rule of law and uh, Poland and the dispersal uh, of funds, uh, Dara, in, in a question, has kind of put the, the, the blunt issue uh, about the, uh, the European People's Party's um, reaction, basically, to, to Orban in particular and how they've handled the Orban situation. Uh, so do you want to take a moment or two just sort of to comment? I mean, I, I, there's an implied sort of criticism that maybe your political group wasn't as strong. Yes, I mean, it, I, well, he's, probably what he's uh, referring to is the pace of, of dealing with the Orban situation. And uh, my own view is uh, that it could have been uh, could have been uh, quicker. Um, we did the right thing in the end. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, when you look at it from the point of view of a party and the engagement of a country, uh, you know, and the Hungarian party involved in the EPP, um, you know, and the very big uh, decision it was to take to exclude. But, you know, it, it was absolutely clear, you know, that it should be done and it was done eventually. Uh, I think the pace could have been could have been uh, quicker. Uh, but across the parliament now, the, the, the question is, you know, are we prepared, you know, to take money from countries that break the rule of law? 
And how important are the fundamental values going to be? Are they more important uh, than the numbers in particular parties? Well, you know, it's going to be interesting to see uh, how that plays out. And, uh, you know, obviously after Brexit, uh, the sensitivities about other countries leaving, I don't think that's actually on the cards uh, at the moment at all, even in, in Poland. And my colleagues from Poland would say that to me, that there's, you know, and we saw that the tens of thousands of people marching in Poland on Sunday. Um, but, you know, this, um, you know, the, the vulnerability, if you like, after Brexit, I, I think is another kind of, uh, is something that uh, impacts on decision making as well. But I, I, I think there's a good debate emerging on it. And I, I, you know, I think we're seeing the conditionality and, you know, I'm not quite sure how it's going to be applied in the months ahead, but it's definitely going to be more and more of an issue and more centre stage. And with the composition of this par uh, parliament, uh, more likely to happen, I think. Okay, thank you for that. Um, another question here, uh, Kieran, and it's uh, for you. Uh, the questioner is is wondering, there's a reference to the imminent arrival of the Greens uh, into government in Germany. Uh, and then the question is what impact that might have on the sort of dynamics or priorities or whatever around green issues at the European level. So can, we, can you give yeah, us the, a reflection on that? The, the, there's always a very interesting dynamic, both within council and within the parliament. Uh, and even though in theory all 27, 27 member states are equal around the table, uh, unless you get to qualified majority voting, in reality the larger member states do call the shots, although many would deny that. And I think if there was a green presence in the German government, it would impact. And not just on uh, the green transition, but I think it would also impact on foreign policy because the Greens have been very strong on calling out uh, Putin and Russia uh, on, on the issue of democracy and rule of law there. Um, so while I don't think it would necessarily impact on, let's say, um, granting permission for Nord Stream 2 for this big gas pipeline, uh, which comes from Russia to Germany, I think it would have an impact on uh, foreign policy. And I think that could be quite interesting to watch. I mean, an observation I would make, and I, going back to the, the last issue of Poland and uh, uh, the issue of Fidesz and Hungary, is that the European Union cannot stand still. Uh, an issue that maybe didn't make the headlines in Ireland is that the West, there are many states in the Western Balkans who wish to be part of the European Union project. They're clamoring at the door. And I think we shouldn't be overly distracted by the issues that we might have with the Czech Republic or Poland or Hungary, we should also be moving the accession states further forward in their bid to get in the door into Europe. It's where we were just over 50 years ago. And it would be, I think, a huge failing if we were to say that the entry door was firmly closed at this stage. And I would hope that the presence of the Greens in Germany would perhaps uh, allow that debate to, to move forward as well. But my hope, if the Greens do end up in a traffic light coalition in Germany, is that we will see a more rapid green transition, which I think would focus uh, on social justice um, rather than simply using market-based uh, instruments to deliver the changes that are needed. Thanks a lot, Kieran. And Dragos, I might put a, a, a final question to you, and Francis and Kieran can pick up on it if they want, but it's, it's back actually to, to the heart of our, our discussions uh, around the, uh, the ORF and issues then around European parliamentary scrutiny. But here's my question. Um, if I think back, when I started working in Ireland as an economist, this goes back to the 1990s, and there was a huge amount of European Union expenditure uh, in Ireland. There was a huge amount of oversight by the European Commission. We did sort of ex-ante evaluations, midterm evaluations, ex-post evaluations. Now, this was all very good, and I think it really sort of crystallised our thinking around how, how best to use funds. But so I suppose I'm wondering, when I heard things about like the European Parliament getting involved in scrutiny, what would be the value added relative to what the Commission does? And is there another potential conflict going to emerge here? I mean, could you be in a situation, for example, that the, um, the parliament would be recommending 
significant changes or the withholding of bonds because the, the scrutiny you know, wasn't yielding uh, what was considered desirable. So it's a big question with sort of a minute left, but uh, maybe if you could even give us a sense of, of how you feel about that one. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very good question. I, I've, been, I've been studying conditionalities in the post Bretton Woods context and, you know, uh, also from the EU perspective. So, so I understand what you're saying. But I mean, I mean, let me give you a concrete example, the rule of law. We've been discussing about it a little bit earlier. Uh, I mean, the question is, uh, without the parliament pressure, would the commission have actually uh, stopped the plans for, from, for Hungary and Poland? I mean, this is this is a very clear example, and, and I, I see Siren actually nodding as well. I mean, we actually were reflecting an important thing that was passed to us by the citizens, and then we acted together. I mean, and, and that's an important thing. Um, the Commission, uh, there are instances, and I'm not, I don't want to generalize, but there are instances where they, where they work. Uh, or they like smoothen up things with the with the member states uh, and with the council generally speaking i mean this is something that is well known it, there is a some sort of a legacy or path dependence towards it um, and, and the role of the parliament is exactly the role in the treaties it's actually to to to, to come up with a perspective that, that would actually be able to uh, um, allow for the union not to be an intergovernmental business i mean that's our role it's about reflecting different components and segments of the society through different you know parties and in the political groups so that we're having that dynamics that would be able to challenge the commission because if the commission will just do deals with the member states everything would be just you know uh, uh, a thing that would actually be a, cl a close end thing where the commission and the council are going to be very you know married happily ever after i mean that's exactly what we don't want to do and that's exactly why the parliament has been created for reducing the de democratic deficit. Um, so, so this is, I, 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 I'm, I'm actually reversing the things around showing that, you know, without the parliament, this would have been just an amount of money spread uh, among member states and with uh, just, uh, you know, digital uh, green and resilience, uh, whoever understood whatever uh, about that word, and then the parliament came and say, okay, guys, I mean, stop. We need to have a cl clarity of, of how the money is going to be spent. So the RRF is exactly the example of how the parliament is actually contributing so that this will not be just a, you know, a game in between member states. I mean, I think that this is making the point actually exactly in the reverse uh, direction. And I've seen Francis wanted to actually add something as well. <laughs> no, really, I, I, I follow that, you know, Alan, I was interested in your observation, but I think in any healthy system of accountability, uh, you need a strong degree of parliamentary scrutiny and oversight. And it almost goes without saying, and it, had, it has completely enriched as opposed to the commission doing it on its own. And there may be conflict, you could be right, but I think that'll lead to a healthier outcome. And, and of course, we have to be elected. So, you know, we're bringing a mandate from the citizens and, and you're putting that directly then into the discussions. Uh, and, you know, it's about, don't talk to me about your values, you know, as Joe Biden says, you know, show me where you spend the money. And we're really looking at where the money um, is, is being spent, you know, show me where you spend the money and I'll tell you what your values are. And I think that's the kind of question and debate we've brought into uh, the discussion in the parliament. Yeah, no, and just uh, and as a, I, go on here, you want to come in? Go yeah, I, I, and I think on that issue of spending money, I think it was very heartening yesterday to see a green bond being issued um, to, to the Commission at, at a negative interest rate, uh, a very significant amount of funding. So the markets are certainly voting for the green transition. And while I may have been somewhat negative in, in my concerns about the pace of change, People often say to me, well, if you'd been here five years ago, uh, what we see happening today is happening at light speed. So I do want to end on that positive note. OK, well, that sounds like a great uh, place to end. Uh, I mean, just, I think I started all with the earlier remarks I was making was sort of my interest in this notion of parliamentary scrutiny uh, comes back from sort of observing the Irish situation for so long and being sort of part of discussions through my membership of the Fiscal Council and others about getting a greater sort of sense of, of parliamentary scrutiny within Ireland, what we were doing. So it is interesting to hear the parallels. And anyway, as three fantastic parliamentarians, you've given a very strong defence uh, of, of why the parliament needs to be uh, involved. Listen, uh, it's been a, a really a, a interesting and enjoyable session, and I'm, I'm just, a, it's important to have to bring it to uh, a close, but Francis Dragas and Kieran Sincere, 
uh, thanks to you all. Uh, thanks to the organizers, IIEA and the European Parliament Office in Ireland. Again, it's been a pleasure for me to do this, uh, do the chairing and uh, just wish everybody now a good afternoon. So thanks. And Thank you.